CPA exam. As a matter of fact, by the end of this call, you're going to feel like you're giving birth to a CPA. So uh, we'll make you a CPA exam expert, but uh, before we do that, I just kind of wanted to touch base real quick on the importance of getting certified and, and also why it's such a great undergraduate or graduate degree to have in accounting. As Jeff mentioned, I'm both a CPA and attorney, but I did not grow up wanting to be either one of those. Uh, real quick, my story is I originally went to Florida State University because I foolishly thought I had a shot at playing uh, football. And true story, I got knocked unconscious at the very first practice and quickly realized that was never going to happen. So after I regained consciousness, um, I think they might have done something to my brain because then I joined the Air Force ROTC because uh, my brother flew uh, F-16s in the Air Force and that seemed like an, an exciting way to make a living. So I wanted to follow in his footsteps. But uh, my first opportunity of flying a jet, I realized I was terrified to fly. So uh, there was another career path that got shot down. So uh, not knowing at 18 what to do, I was fortunate. I had an uncle who was uh, a partner back then with one of the big eight accounting firms. And uh, this is pretty sad, but at 18 I did not know what CPA stood for. I just knew my uncle was a CPA. He had two really nice homes, two really nice cars, and his big fat boat down the Jersey Shore. And this is before Snooky and all them got down there. But uh, I said, man, if you're a CPA, uh, I want to be a CPA too. So uh, with that being said though, I will tell you I, I think it's you know in business I, I, and really all the majors that you can think of in, in, in college, I think you get a tremendous return on your investment in both time and money. Uh, I'm going to presume that most of you did not grow up aspiring to be CPAs, uh, but your motivation to get certified, while it may not be your love of accounting, you'll find that three, these three letters will pay you back the rest of your career and, and in multiple ways. Uh, first and foremost, I have an assignment for you. Uh, you should Google the difference in income in your state uh, between a CPA and a non-CPA. So just take a look. If you're an accounting major, look at the difference in income potential between being certified and not being certified. And then understand that's, that's not a one-time differential. That difference in income will follow you the rest of your 35 or 40 year career and probably grow over time. So do a little discounted cash flow analysis, take the present value of that future cash flow, discount that at about 3% and it is worth a lot of money. It could be worth seven figures. So that's reason number one to get certified. Uh, obviously if you're in the field of public accounting, many of you know, uh, many public accounting firms will not promote you to senior unless you get certified. Uh, certainly no firm will promote you to manager unless you're certified. So within the firm, your career opportunities start to get limited if you're not certified. And just so that you understand, you know, sometimes people are a victim of their own success. And what I mean by that is once you start working full time, if you're doing well at your job, which, which many of you probably will, you'll be in high demand. And because you're in such high demand, and you're going to find it difficult to find time to study. And that's why another message that we want to get across today is the importance to get certified or at least try to get multiple parts of the exam out of the way that summer before you start working full time. Because probably one of the most important factors in, uh, in success or lack thereof is the time you put in. So you need that time. But in terms of the value of the credential, even you know, once you're in public accounting, if you decide you know, two or four years in, many, many of you will decide to leave public accounting and do other things, you, know, you should talk to some headhunters and talk to your friends who graduated two, three, four years ago. And they'll tell you, you know, how you're pursued at the firm. I mean, headhunters will be seeking you out and there will be a lot of job opportunities, um, but those opportunities again are limited if you're not certified. So those calls from the headhunter will be fewer and far in between if you don't have the exam and the credential. If any of you all are thinking about going to grad school or, or law school, I can tell you from a personal experience that I know I was accepted to better law schools because I had work experience and I was a CPA. I had personalized acceptance letters that referenced that fact. Uh, some of you might be dual majors, uh, um, you know, possibly accounting and finance. I, at one point in my career, I uh, went on to pursue uh, the CFA, which is uh, for Chartered Financial Analysts, and it's like the credential to have in finance. 
but uh, it's ironic that a lot of people who go into finance dislike the counting, but I love when they tell me how much they dislike the counting, like they hated it with a passion. No worries, but the only problem is on the credential to have in the field of finance, if you want to be a portfolio manager, a hedge fund manager, equity analyst, fixed income, you want to work in corporate finance, investment banking, the credential to have is, is the CFA. And the most heavily tested topics on that exam in levels one and two are accounting. And there's no doubt that my, my background in accounting significantly helped me when I prepared for those exams. And even in law school, there wasn't a lot in law school, other than criminal law and constitutional law, there wasn't a lot that I had not already seen by virtue of studying for the CPA exam. So uh, the goal here today is to get you familiar, you know, demystify it, what's it all about, and, and I would just tell I'll guarantee you something, I am no smarter than anyone on this call, guaranteed, and, and I'm sure I'd have volunteers from high school who would uh, verify that fact on my behalf. But uh, nobody outworks me. So this exam is extremely doable if you put in the time and effort and you have a good plan. So part of the process today is getting you familiar with the content, the structure, the format of the exam. And then also for those of you who are sophomores and juniors, we kind of want to help you get a little guidance in uh, selecting your electives, uh, some classes that might help you in terms of preparing for the exam. In addition, we strongly recommend, if possible, to try in your graduating semester to not have a heavy class load. If you can carry, you know, maybe two or three classes, no more than 12 credits in your graduating semester, you can go a long way in starting your preparation for the exam. So with that being said, let's jump in. I know you're all excited to get certified. Let's do it. Okay, obtaining your license, just so that you know, every state, every jurisdiction sets its own requirements for education, examination, and experience. It's the state that will grant you your license to practice as a CPA. Just so that you all know, you know, for many of you, the state you get licensed in, and if you're going to school in one state but you think you may work in another state, as a general rule of thumb, you want to look to get licensed in the state where you're going to take your first job. Most states have what's called reciprocity, so that if you get licensed in the state of California, you can then seek to get a license in Texas or New York without having to retake the exam. But when in doubt, well, I'm going to give you a website, nasba.org, N-A-S-B-A.org, or you can start at the Becker website and we'll link you there. Each state will tell you what they need in terms of requirements. If you hold yourself to the highest possible standard, you'll have no problem whatsoever in getting that reciprocity. It becomes important what state you get licensed in. If someday you want to legally sign off on an audit in a particular state, then you need to be licensed in that state. But truth be told, for many of us, you know, you can be licensed in any state and put it on your resume, your business card, you can certainly use the letters. So uh, there's a lot of flexibility. We can always talk about that offline. There are four partners that are involved in the certification process. There's your state, your individual state. There's NASBA. NASBA's kind of, you know, the clearinghouse. They're trying to promote uniformity between all the states. So they provide services to all the states and, and they facilitate interstate practice. So they kind of collect all the candidate information and scores. They're kind of like a central clearinghouse for all the states when it comes to submitting information on eligible candidates. So that's what NASBA does. The role of the AICPA, the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, they're, they're going to determine the content, the question, the scores. They do all the statistical analysis. And then there's an organization called Prometric. That's the test centers. They have a network of computer-based test centers all around the world. Just so that you all know, if, if you want to get licensed in New York, you don't need to physically take the exam at a Prometric center in New York. You could take it anywhere. So it's important in terms of where you send the paperwork. That's important. But then once you sign up with a Prometric center, it could be anywhere in approved jurisdiction. So that's, uh, that's good news. Okay. Now, every state does this a little bit differently. That's why we're going to emphasize the word most, okay? Because uh, many of you are attending from different states. There's a general rule of thumb to be eligible to sit for the exam. Some states require you to have at least 120 credit hours to be eligible to sit. 
other states say, no, to be eligible to sit for the exam, you're going to have 150. So you've got to look at your particular state. It's very simple. Again, if you go to nasba.org or you go to the becker.com website, we'll link you to the states. You'll see exactly what you need in your state. So again, some states you need 120 to sit. Other states you need 150. That doesn't necessarily mean, though, that you need the 120 or the 150 at the time you sit. What I mean by that is some states will say, well, we want 150 credit hours, but we'll allow you to register and sit for the exam, and you just merely have to complete your 150 credit hours or 120 within maybe 90 days or 120 days of the date you first sit for the exam. So again, you've got to do a little bit of research. Very simple, though. Once you get to the website, you'll see exactly what it is for your particular state. Most states, to get licensed, not to sit for the exam, but to actually get the license, are eventually going to require 150 semester hours. It's the equivalent of a master's degree, but you do not need a specific master's degree in accounting or taxation. So every state lists for you exactly how many credit hours they want in accounting, business law, tax, audit, whatever it may be. So it's relatively easy once you research the issue. And, and Becker is like kind of the resident expert on that because we have folks in every single state. So if you have any questions, you can certainly contact us and, and we can get you the answer instantaneously for your state. No worries. OK, now there are four sections of the exam. OK, now the four sections, as you can see, financial. Financial is predominantly your intermediate one, intermediate two, your advanced accounting. There's the audit section of the exam. Many of you are required to take two full classes in audit, two separate three credit classes in audit, which is great. If your school doesn't require you to take two separate audit classes, you might want to consider that, okay, even if it's an elective. Regulation is predominantly tax and business law. Now, I'll talk about the content and regulation, but many schools, many states only require one three credit class in tax, man, you want to definitely take that second class in tax. Even if at your school it's an elected, listen, when the average person on the street hears you're a CPA, they're going to immediately think you're an expert in tax. So there are multiple reasons why you want to take that second class in tax. In addition, you may think you want to start out your career in audit, but how do you really know that? I mean, you want to be prepared to possibly do audit and or tax. I mean, you know, you, you don't marry somebody after the first date, right? You kind, of, uh, you kind of keep your options open a little bit. So, you know, you may think right now you want to do audit, but you may turn out you don't like it and you want to do tax or vice versa. So it's definitely worthwhile to say, take that second class in tax. And by the way, I know it's many years down the road, but some of you may aspire to have your own accounting practice someday. The vast majority of accountants who own their own practice, I mean, you do tax. It's going to be awfully difficult for a sole proprietor to pick up an IBM as an audit client. That's not going to happen. So uh, even though you may start your career in audit, you may someday want to have your own practice, you know, so that tax knowledge will, uh, will always benefit you. If you're aspiring to go to law school, just so that you all know, there's almost tax issues in every legal issue. You get a divorce, there are tax issues. Buy or sell real estate, there are tax issues. Estate planning, there are tax issues. Uh, in finance, you know, if you all aspire to be uh, uh, you know, investment bankers or portfolio managers, there are always tax issues. Mergers and acquisitions, same thing, so it's a great background to have. The BEC section of the exam, as you can see, is like the reg of three-hour exam. BEC is kind of a catch-all. It's got a variety of different topics, as you'll see. The passing score on each part is 75%. So you don't need a 90, okay? You just need a 75%, which is definitely doable. But I will tell you this, of all the exams that I've sat for, whether it's the different levels of the CFA, the different parts of the CPA, or the bar exam, you've got to make a commitment in time and have a good plan if you want to be successful in passing that exam, okay? So it is definitely, definitely doable, but you've got to have a good plan. The great thing is you do not need to sit for all four parts at the same time. Many, many years ago, that was the case, no longer. So I'm going to talk to you about how you can spread this out to make it far more manageable for you. You can divide and conquer, and you should divide and conquer. OK, now experience has nothing to do at all with sitting for the exam, OK? Nothing whatsoever. 
The experience is just for you to get your license. So you can sit for the exam even though you don't have the work experience yet. Most, again, varies by state, but most states you need somewhere around two years of work experience under a CPA. Now, if you have that 150 credit hours, that might be reduced from two years to one year. But that's, again, when if you go to nasba.org or you go to becker.com, it'll link you to your particular state, and we'll show you exactly what the work experience requirement is. Now, it could be public accounting, and for a lot of you, we'll start in public accounting, which is great, or it could even be an industry. In most states, if you go immediately into industry, again, you'd have to either work under the direct supervision of a CPA in most states or have a CPA sign off on your application. And we could talk to you about that offline. Different types of work, there's a whole host of things you could do. So obviously tax, internal audit, external audit, cost and managerial accounting. So there's lots of ways to get that experience requirement. And, and I just want to throw my two cents in again about what I love about public accounting. I mean, think about your friends right now who are marketing majors or management. I, I'm not knocking that at all. But, you know, firms so heavily recruit at your schools when you're an accounting major. You get wined and dined. And in public accounting, you all need to be aggressive with your own career. What I mean by that is when that firm interviews you, you in turn want to interview them in terms of what kind of experience can you get. You, if you, you want to see audit and tax, if at all possible. If you think you want to do tax, you want to get exposure in individual, corporate, gift, estate, trust taxation, so you get a feel, date a little bit, see what you really like and who you want to see more of, right? If you're an audit, you know what? You want to get, have a feel for it. Well, do you like retail, manufacturing, insurance, banking, financial services, whatever it may be? But seek out those areas, show an interest, take initiative, and say, hey, I really, because that's where many of your job opportunities will come from down the line. So such another great advantage of being a CPA. Okay, the resources, as I've mentioned, here you got Becker.com, so we have the information for all the states, the State Board of Accountancy, if you Google for your state, you can get there, Ways to CPA, NASPA.org. So again, with respect to the experience requirement, the education, everything for your specific state, you could obviously research that piece of cake. Okay, here are the steps for the CPA exam process. First thing you're going to want to do is find out from your state, okay, what do I need in terms of, don't worry about experience, what do I need in terms of education? And then you've got to, again, if you're unsure of what state you want to get licensed in, you might want to consider the state that holds you to the highest standard. This way you'll have no issues with reciprocity. However, if you get licensed in a state that, let's say, required only 120 credit hours for a license, but then you want to transfer to a state that requires, let's say, 150 credit hours, for the most part, you're not going to have to worry about taking the exam again, but you will eventually have to get those other 30 credit hours if you want to get licensed in that state if it becomes an issue. So review the state requirements, see exactly what they want in terms of credit hours, and then see if they will let you sit before you actually get those credit hours. Because as I said earlier, many states will allow you to sit even if they want the 150, but you don't need the 150 at the time you sit for the very first part. Some states want you to have the 150, but some states say, hey, so long as you complete the 150 within 90 days or 120 days, you can start sitting now. And this is an academic exam. The longer you're out of school, the harder it is to get to pass. So while it's fresh in your mind and you're not yet working full time, that's the best time to sit for the exam. Okay, now sitting for the exam requires you to fill out multiple applications, okay? Every time you want to take a part of the exam, you have to apply. Now, when it comes to submitting your application, it could take four to six weeks to complete the application process, so you want to keep that in mind. When it comes to preparing, uh, uh, preparing all the paperwork and sending it in, some states handle it on their own. So you'll pay the application and examination fees directly to your state board of accountancy. Other states, smaller states usually, well then that's where they engage NASBA, the National Association of the State Boards of Accountancy, and they'll take care of the whole application process. Again, your particular state board lays that out, exactly where they want the fees mailed, whether it be to them directly, the state, or to NASBA. There's an application fee, 
okay, that's established by and paid directly to your board of accountancy, an application fee, and then there's an examination fee. The examination fees, depending upon, depend upon which sections you want to sign up for, as a general rule of thumb, you don't want to sign up for a section and pay for it unless you plan on taking that part. So what you're going to see is this thing called a notice to schedule. When you sign up for the exam, you're going to buy a notice to schedule, so to speak. That NTS for many states says here are the parts you are eligible to sit for over this six-month period of time. So that notice to schedule for most states tells you here are the parts you've paid for to sit over the next six-month window. Some states, by the way, the no NTS only gives you three months. Some other states give you nine or 12 months. But as a general rule, that NTS shows you the parts you've paid for and that you're eligible to sit for within that six-month window. It gives you the earliest date you can take your first part, the last date you could take your last part that you paid for. If you pay for a part and you don't take it within that six-month window, within that NTS period, there's no refunds. You don't get your money back. You will have made a donation to the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. And they have enough money, so don't make that donation, okay? So make sure you don't sign up unless you plan on sitting for it. Okay. Now, you're going to schedule, after you get your NTS, you're going to schedule your exam with Pro Prometric. Okay, now Prometric again, you can schedule with them until after you receive your NTS. General rule of thumb, you're going to want to schedule with Prometric as soon as possible after you get your NTS. This way you can lock in the dates that you want. Now there's a lot of information about, okay, which order do you sit for the parts in? When, how much time do you need to study? You know, uh, when the Becker course starts, when does it end, when do you need to, you know, how much time do you need after the course ends? As a general rule of thumb, on our, first of all, Becker has a, this entire uh, process laid out for you step by step. So when you enroll in Becker, you're going to get this exam planner, this matrix that's going to show you when the classes begin, when the course ends, when you should schedule your exam, and then when the next part, so on and so forth. As a general rule of thumb, when the course ends, you generally need at least two weeks after the course ends to do your final review. Okay, so keep that in mind that you never want to schedule the exam too close to the very last class for that part of the exam. Okay, now success. I'll tell you that Becker students pass at twice the rate of non-Becker students. There's all these incredible uh, award winners who score, you know, these top scores. But these are people who are dedicated and have a good plan and they stick to it. So I'm going to talk to you about the time that you need, but you've got to have a good plan. Okay, so everything starts with that plan. Now, the exam is on demand. So the way it works is when you get your NTS, you have six months, a six-month window. So really you have two quarters to take the exam. So you can take as many parts as you want. Let's say your, your exam runs from January 1, six months. That would get you your first and second quarter. You could sit for all four parts in January, but that would be insane. Information overload. You would dilute your study knowledge. You don't want to do that. As a general rule of thumb, you don't want to sit for more than two parts in a particular window. January and February, you can sit for parts of the exam. March, you cannot. March is closed, but in March, while you can't sit for an exam, you can certainly start your studies for what you're going to take in April and May. If you take an exam in January, early January, and let's say you get your results, usually if you sit towards the end of a window, it could take maybe you know six to ten business days for you to get your results. Conversely, if you sit in the beginning of the window, early January, it could take you several weeks to get your results. But if you sit for a part in January, and let's just say, God forbid, you're unsuccessful, you cannot sit again in February. You would not be able to sit for that apart again, for that apart again, I sound like I just came from Italy. You would not be able to sit for that part again until April. So if you fail a part, you cannot sit again in that same window. And just as an FYI, you know what? It's a game of perseverance. You know, less than 20% of CPAs pass each part on the first attempt. I mean, truth be told, because it you know, involves a lot of study and you know, sometimes you know, your life gets interrupted, whether it be at work, school, family. It's not the end of the world if you fail apart. Okay? It happens. You just got to persevere. So 
if you do fail a part, my recommendation is if you fail within 10 points of passing, if you fail with a 65 or higher, my advice is before you continue your studies for the next part, while that information for that first part is fresh in your mind, I would retake that part. I would start going back over all my notes, my homework, focus on that part again, because then you'll probably pass in the 80s, okay? So that's generally my advice. So again, most states, you get a six-month NTS. You could take, you know, as many parts as you want in that six-month window. Certainly, it's doable to get all four parts out of the way in that six-month window, but you don't have to do it that way. Okay, you have to pass all four parts within 18 months of when you pass your very first part. So let's say you sit for your first exam, January 15th. You pass that exam. Well, then the 18-month window begins to close from January 15th, the date you sat and passed that first part. Now, the order in which you take the parts is extremely important. The reason the order you take the parts is so important is because they're not all of equal level difficulty. I'm sure many of you heard of LIFO. Some of you heard of FIFO. Well, now I'm going to teach you about HIFO. That's right, HIFO with an H. Hardest one in, first one out. You never want to leave financial to last. Never leave financial to last. That part requires the most amount of time to study. So you generally want to knock out financial either the first part or the second part because, God forbid, you have to take financial and now you start working full-time and you don't have enough time to study, you don't want to lose parts that you passed early on. It's a rolling process. So if you pass that part January 15th, 18 months later you haven't com completed the exam, you'll lose that part you passed first on January 15th. You don't stall all over again, you just lose that one part. You, that's not going to happen to you because we're going to give you good advice and you're going to follow it. So hardest one in, first one out. You generally want to do financial first or second. The parts you generally leave for last, okay, is not financial, okay? We'll talk about what you're going to leave for last in a second. While we're on the topic of financial, okay, the way the structure is for financial, and by the way, this structure you're seeing, this 60-40 split, 60% 60 multiple choice, 40% task-based simulations, that is applicable for three parts of the exam, okay? The three parts, audit, financial and reg have a 60-40 split. The multiple choice is break in, broken into testlets. Depending upon the section of the exam, it could be 24 to 30 questions per testlet. In financial, it's 30. You're going to have on average about a minute and a half per question. You've got to know your stuff very well. And you've got to keep in mind that some questions are designed to be answered in 15 seconds because others might take closer to three or four minutes. So you want to make sure that when you do your homework, not only did you get it right for the right reason, but if it's a question you should have gotten right in 15 seconds, but it took you two minutes, well, in a lot of ways, you didn't get that question correct. Another piece of advice. You see this thing called pretest questions? On every section of the CPA exam, all four parts, there are multiple choice questions and one task-based simulation that do not count toward your score. Those questions are there to develop future exams, questions for future exams. They want to make sure they're fair questions. This is why you never spin your wheels on an individual multiple choice. God forbid you spend five minutes on a question and it doesn't even count toward your score. And even if it does count toward your score and you spend five or six minutes, I don't care if you get it correct because human nature is your body clock is going to tell you, well, now I need to start speeding up. And then all of a sudden, what would have been easy becomes difficult because you're rushing and now you're starting to make silly mistakes, but that will not happen to you. All right. Now, the seven task-based simulations. What's a task-based simulation? It's a problem. So all it is is, you know, uh, it's a, a set of facts where instead of answering a single multiple choice question, you're going to have to answer multiple questions, but you may have to fill out, let's say, a statement of cash flow. You may have to fill in an income statement. You may have to fill in a tax form. It may be some kind of matching. But you know what, if you know the content well enough to answer multiple choice, you can certainly, certainly answer the task-based simulations. And our software will prepare you for all that. Look at the content for financial. You all see the governmental and not-for-profit. Huge. Okay, you're looking at approximately 20% of the exam. Many schools do not require you to take a class in governmental and not-for-profit. So, if it's an elective, you should seriously consider taking that governmental and not-for-profit 
because it's so heavily tested. Now, if you don't take the governmental not-for-profit, the great thing about Becker is there's no expectation of prior knowledge. We teach you everything as, you haven't, as though you haven't seen it before anyway. It would be nice if you've seen it before because then Becker would truly be a review. But even though we're called a review course, man, that, you know, sometimes there's things you didn't see in school. We recognize that. We'll teach it to you. The only reason I'm emphasizing this is invariably 20% of the content throughout these four parts of the exam, there's going to be things you haven't seen before. When you put together your study plan, you need to be mindful of those topics and be ready to watch those lectures more than once. The first time you go through it, you're learning it. The second time you go through the lecture, you're reviewing it. The audit section of the exam, again, 60-40 split. So you've got your multiple choice, you've got your task-based simulations, you have pre-testing again. The key thing is with audit, most of you should consider if you're going to do audit for a living, if that's what you think you're going to do when you get hired, audit's a part you might want to sit for last because if you are working full time and you're pressed for time, audit wouldn't be all that difficult to study for while working full time because when you get hired, you'll get your new hire training. You're actually doing it day in, day out for a living. So if you had to study for audit, wouldn't be all that difficult. So audit's a part for many of you you should consider sitting for last, okay? Easiest one, last one. Okay, the audit content. Most schools do a great job in preparing you for all this content. You know, there could be topics here and there that you haven't seen, but for the most part, if you have two classes in audit, two, three credit classes, you'll cover all that. Again, if your school only requires one class in audit, you again might want to think about taking that second audit class as an elective. For those of you um, who are going to be sitting for the exam shortly, okay, new statement on auditing standards, which is going to include a lot of international standards, the exam is changing format in July. So for everyone who sits after July, you're going to be held to this standard. You've got to know not only the historical U.S. Internet, uh, standards, but the international audit standards as well. So if you, you know, all things being equal, for those of you who are ready to take the exam now, you might want to consider sitting for audit before July 1 so that you're not responsible for the new standards. That's all. Because many of you may not have been taught that in college. But hey, again, Becker's prepared. We recognize that. So if you sit after July 1, don't panic. We'll teach you what you need to know. You'll be in good shape. Okay, the regulation exam, just like the other two, 60-40 split. But instead of having 90 multiple choice, you have 72. So it's probably about 24 questions per testlet. You have a little bit more time per question, a little bit more math intensive. Instead of having six, excuse me, seven, you're only going to have six task-based simulations. And this is dominated by tax, so it's not unlikely you're going to have to fill out a tax form. So 12 multiple choice here, one task-based simulation. Don't count toward your score just like the other three parts. Now, the regulation content, dominated by tax, dominated by tax. So when you look at all this content and tax, you know, you're talking 70 to 80 percent of the exam is tax. Many of you, if not all of you, are going to have a class in individual tax. No worries. The question then becomes, have you done the partnership, the corporate tax? Have you done the gift, the estate? So all of that is generally given in a second tax class as an elective take that second tax class. Even though it's an elective, do your best to make sure you take that. The rest of the regulation section of the exam is business law. I teach a lot of the business law. Good news is, even if you haven't seen a particular topic, we teach it as though you haven't seen it before, but there's no math involved. It's all theory. Put the time in, you'll do very well. The ethics and professional and legal responsibilities, some of that's tax related, some of it's not tax related but heavily tested, and just as an FYI, don't think you don't have to study for ethics. Sometimes straightforward topic, really challenging questions, so we'll prepare you well for the ethics. Oh, and by the way, if you think you're going to do tax for a living, if you think you're going to do tax for a living, regulation's the part you probably want to leave for last. If you get your new hire training in tax, you do it day in, day out. If you're working full time, you should have no problem with the regulation. Okay, the BEC section is unique for multiple reasons. Number one, Look at the structure, it's 85% multiple choice instead of 60. And like regulation 72 questions, the big difference is written communications. If English is not your first language, 
you're going to have to put in a little bit more time in preparing for the, for the written communication. Even if English is your first language, you certainly want to see what the structure of the questions are likely to look like, what they're looking for. It's actually, ironically, not testing the content. It's not like they're going to ask you to list, well, what are the requirements to have a capitalized lease? They want to make sure you can clearly communicate in a memo or a letter to your manager, to a partner, to a client. You want to be able to identify the issue. What's the rule? Give the proper analysis. Clearly state a conclusion or recommendation. So you'll see we have that laid out very nicely in the software. So 15% of the BEC exam, again, the three written communications, okay? So you'll be in good shape. We'll keep you well prepared. The content in business is kind of a little bit of everything, but not a lot of anything, okay? So this is where you're going to see your cost of managerial accounting. Your cost of managerial accounting, okay, is, is you know, you, you probably had a three credit class in cost, a three credit class in managerial, but you don't get a big reward. It's only like 20 to 25 percent of this section of the exam. You're going to have economics, macro, micro, global. We'll walk you through exactly what you need to know. Corporate governance is a lot of theory. Okay, good corporate governance. Reduce the probability the firm's going to release financial statements that are materially misstated. A lot of operations management, strategic planning. You have your IT. You have financial management, which is a lot of corporate finance, weighted average cost of capital, NPV analysis, things of that nature. BEC, I would just tell you, for most students, okay, the BEC tends to be a little bit easier to study for. It has, relatively speaking, the least amount of content. Okay, so the BEC section, uh, something you might want to consider leaving for last, especially if you're going to do industry accounting. You're going to go into cost or managerial right out of school. Okay, now, in terms of exam functionality, okay, in terms of exam functionality, you want to make sure when you do your homework and you practice, you want to make sure you practice under exam conditions. Okay, you want to make sure you're practicing under exam conditions. So they don't allow you to bring a calculator into the exam. So you want to use the calculator that's provided in the software. Time management is critical as you get closer to the exam. But initially, when you start studying, you want to slow down. You want to learn from your questions. You want to learn from your mistakes. If you get it right, did you get it right for the right reason? Time management is more critical as you get closer to taking the actual exam. But initially, your goal is to learn and master the material. The multiple choice, this is what the format looks like. As a matter of fact, this is exactly what that computer-based exam is going to look like on exam day, with the exception of, unfortunately, there's no Becker logo. We can't convince them to get the Becker logo in there. So outside of that, I mean, this is exactly what it'll look like exam day. So it'll give you your time remaining, all that kind of good stuff. Calculators available if you need it. You want to practice that in our software so you're familiar with using it. So this AICPA calculator embedded in the Becker software, you'll be an expert. No problems. Simulations. So these are those problems, right? So here we give you an example of statement of cash flow. Well, you're going to be ready. Direct method, indirect method. Here it happens to be the indirect method. How do we know that? We're starting with net income. So they're going to want you to fill this in. Where are you going to fill it in? Well, you need financial statements. So you'll have different features. You'll be able to split the screen so you can have all the information available to you. And then you can fill in your spreadsheet. So you'll have lots of homework that's going to give you that ability to uh, practice this, okay? So you'll be an expert in doing the task-based simulation. But again, statement of cash flow, whether they tested in multiple choice or in a problem format, you got to know the same content. Okay, authoritative literature, you might have to do some research. So embedded in our textbooks, you're going to see key words. So because in the real world, nobody walks around having all this information. For, you're going to know more about accounting on the day you take the financial section than the rest of your career. So a lot of times, it's like a Google search for accountants. So by keywords, you know, it might be a pension question. It might be an operating lease, capital lease, a bond issued at a premium, a discount. You're going to have to know, well, hey, what are the buzzwords so that I can do the research? So the research task, depending upon the section of the exam, you could be researching uh, standards of accounting. It could be uh, auditing standards. It could give you access to the internal revenue code. So they just want to make sure you could do some research. As we mentioned, written communication, again, if English is your second language, you weren't educated in the U.S., you might have to put in a little bit more time in preparing for this. For the most part, again, 
The goal is to look at the examples and see, spend time on our detailed explanatory answer, and you could see exactly what the grader is going to be looking for so you can maximize your points. Okay, before I wrap this up, I just want to give you an indication of the time and effort you're going to have to put in to study for these exams. Our course in financial has 10 classes, 10 classes, 4 hours a class. You're going to easily be doing 4, 40 hours with us. You're probably going to be doing 3 to 4 hours outside of class. So you need to allocate about 200 plus hours to be prepared for the financial section of the exam. If you spread that out over eight weeks, that's very manageable. You can't cram for this exam, so you want to spread it out, okay? Regulation, you're probably going to spend, you know, we have eight classes, about 32 hours with us. In total, you'll probably do about 150 hours for regulation and audit. BEC is probably closer to 100 or 125 hours. But listen, you don't have to do this the rest of your life. Take the exam once, study hard, do it right. It'll pay you back the rest of your life. Remember how we started this seminar. Look at the differential in income. You want to make sure. Listen, no one goes to law school and then doesn't pass the bar exam. You all need to treat the CPA exam as seriously as law students treat the bar. And it's not, again, your love of accounting. You want to max out on this background in accounting. It's a fantastic starting point and it'll pay you back the rest of your career. And before I go, because of all the hours you're going to have to put in studying, you need to explain to your boyfriend or girlfriend the importance of getting certified and the difference it's going to make in your earnings potential. And they need to support you in that endeavor. Chances are on Saturdays and Sundays you're going to be studying 8 to 10 hours a day. They need to not give you, listen, if they're giving you a hard time saying all you ever do is study, you're a boring accountant, I'm going to go out, let them go out and find somebody else. Because after you get certified, you're going to be making so much more money, chances are you're going to upgrade anyway. That aside, I want to do my first regression analysis with you. I want to regress the probability of passing the CPA exam against happiness. You know what that relationship is? Inversely related. Okay, the more happy you are, the less Likely it is you're going to pass if you're miserable and you're studying all the time. That short time that you put in in your terms of 40-year career, the higher the probability of passing and you will have the advantage of those three letters after your name the rest of your life. Let's all hold hands and kumbaya, man. I'm ready to go. All right. My Becker friends. Jeff, somebody help me. I drank too much coffee. Jump in. <laughs> Hi, Peter. This is Stacy Ray. I'm the program manager here at Becker Professional Education. Um, as we mentioned earlier in the webinar, we are going to be taking your questions. I've been trying to get to as many um, via the online chat system as possible, but uh, we have a whole lot of questions, Peter, so I'm not going to delay any further. Um, uh, you know, so I'm going to go through and just ask you some questions, and feel free to answer those. Um, so the first question is, um, to which jurisdiction should I apply? I'm not sure whether I will be working in New Jersey or New York. What's your thoughts on that, Peter? Yeah, what, what I would recommend is, first of all, I would, uh, it, you know, if, if you're primarily searching for a job in New York, then I would probably skew towards New York. If you think you're going to be working in New Jersey, then I might say New Jersey, but truth be told, all things being equal, um, I would look to the state that you know is going to be easiest for you in terms of getting to sit for the exam as quickly as possible. So again, research what they want in New York and New Jersey, and this is true for every state. And when in doubt, if you're indifferent, find the state that's going to allow you to sit for the exam sooner rather than later, and then you could worry about reciprocity later on in your career. You just don't want to get in a position where you start working full time and, and you haven't passed any parts yet. So all things being equal, the state that allows you to sit sooner is the state I'd go for. Great, great. Um, does, uh, next question is from Jennifer. Does a CPA license in one state, is it applicable to another or would I have to retake the CPA exam? No, you do not have to retake the exam. So once you get licensed in a particular state, you put it on your resume, your business card. As a general rule of thumb, what could happen someday is if you make partner at a firm, 
and you want to legally sign off on an audit in a particular state, amongst other things, then you have to actually be licensed in that state. But for the most part, you know, it, it's, 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 it, that's why it's a uniform CPA exam, because you, you, this way you don't have to get individually licensed in every state across the country. So for the most part, aside of a couple of transactions, man, once you're a CPA in one state, you're, you, you know, you're, you're good to practice in every state. Great. Um, next question is from Brenda, um, and it, it is uh, pertaining to the cycle of taking the exam. So what's your recommendation after I take one exam, and I'm not sure whether I passed or not? Okay. Uh, should I go ahead and sit for the next, or oh, go ahead? You never, ever let that time go by. So if you're sitting in the beginning of a window, and then you've got that, let's say, three or four week period while you're waiting for your results, time is of the essence. You start studying for your next part. What's done is done. You did the best you could on that part. You got to let it go. Focus your attention on the part you're studying for. If, like I said earlier, you get your results, and now I've started, let's say I sat for financial, I'm waiting for my results, I start studying for regulation. I'm three weeks into the course and I get my results for financial. And unfortunately you fail, let's say a 68 or a 72, whatever it is. I would continue my course for regulation, taking my notes and, and completing the course, but I would forego the homework and all, and all the details in regulation. I would go back while financial is still relatively fresh in my mind because with that topic now being so fresh, it'll truly be a review course. And now you're likely to pass the next time, you know, 85, 90. But you can't sit again in that same window. So while you'd have to wait to the next window, no worries. You've got to register for it again, pick a date, but no problem. You, 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 that's the way you should go. Great, Peter. And, and speaking as someone who's currently sitting for the exams, um, you know, it, it, you, you don't always walk out of the uh, exam feeling like you just climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. Sometimes it feels like I'm a little uh, winded and, and need a little bit of a break. But, you know, amazing thing is, is that even though you, you uh, because of the pretest questions, you may think that there were, were uh, questions that you didn't get right and maybe you didn't do the best. Um, sometimes when you get that score back, it's, it's, it's been a complete surprise. So just keep that in mind. Um, next question, Peter, is, um, you know, I'm a, 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 a non-traditional student um, studying for the exam. What recommendations do you have for working adults? How do we fit okay. in the amount of study hours that you're talking about? Okay. Becker prides themselves on people just like yourself. I mean, there's nothing more satisfying than taking somebody who's been out of school a long time or was a C student. You know, married, kids, career, and they don't think they can do it, and then lo and behold, we get you through the exam. Here's my recommendation. If you've been out of school a while and you're a working adult now, you just need to spread it out. What I mean by that is, I mentioned earlier, within each window, which is two months you can sit, one month you can't, I would probably sit for just one part per window. Because again, out of sight, out of mind. It, you know, the, it, rather than 80% of the content being a review, Maybe 20% will be a review. 80% you're relearning because it's been so long since you've seen that. But that doesn't mean you can't do it. You can do it. You just got to structure your study plan a little bit differently. So don't try to sit for two parts in a particular window. Try to sit for just one part per window. Focus your undivided attention. Give yourself probably instead of for financial, instead of the 200 hours, give yourself 300 hours. Give yourself that extra time and you can do it and you will do it. Great, Peter. Uh, next question comes from Anna. Um, what kind of po what's our policy if I if I take the exam and I don't pass? Becker's policy. Yes. Yeah. So the, oh, that's a great question. We have this thing called the Becker Promise, and the great thing about this Becker Promise, it's your insurance policy. Basically, you have to attend all the lectures either live or online, whatever format you want to take. If you attend all the lectures and you do all the homework. You earn this certificate, and this Becker promise then you can repeat the course tuition free. But the great news is we track all our students, and those who come to class, and those who do all the homework pass at a double the rate of the average student. So that's why it's two for one. You put that time and effort in, you pass the exam, but then God forbid you don't, something happens, the Becker promise kicks in, and then you can repeat the course as needed tuition free. 
Great, great. Um, next question is from Gladstone. Um, when would be the best time to take the exam? During our senior year, after graduation, et cetera? It depends. If in your graduating semester, semester, I mentioned earlier, if you can plan your schedule in advance so that in your graduating semester you're only taking two or three classes and your state allows you to sit before you've graduated, I would start sitting and preparing in my graduating semester. If you're carrying 18 credits, then it's impossible. But at a minimum, that summer before you work full time, do not go backpacking across Europe. Don't do it. Let your friends go. And then someday they'll be coming to you for a loan because you're going to be making the big money. Take that summer, and that's when you want to knock out, if not all four parts, at least two parts of the exam. Because again, the difference between success and failure is time. And you're never going to have more time than that summer before you graduate plus the information is still relatively fresh in your head. Get that financial section out of the way that summer before you start working full time. Great, Peter. Um, we've had a lot of questions uh, from students who um, are wondering, you know, since, since they can get the 150 hours um, without getting a master's degree, you know, whether or not they should really go on and get that degree. You know, you know, so many different schools of thought. I'm just of the opinion that, like I mentioned earlier, kidding around, you know, you date before you get married. You know, a master's to me is a very important decision, what you want to get that concentration in. And I don't feel that it's really an informed judgment until you have two to four years work experience. So I would say fulfill your credit hours generically so you're eligible to sit for the exam. And then you can get an MBA or a master's in taxation or a law degree, but work two, three, four years so that you can get a feel for, hey, yeah, this is something I'm passionate about. Then you can apply those credits and many, school will give, many schools will give you credits towards the MBA because you have all those, those credit hours towards the CPA. I'm just of the opinion, before you put all your eggs in one basket, make sure that's the basket you want the rest of your life, you know, because it's a big commitment in terms of time and money. That's that's a great great um, that's a that's a great explanation, Peter. Um, our next question comes from Sarah. She is wondering um, if she has to be a resident of a state before she takes the exam, and um, you know what's your recommendation there? Yeah, again, that's that's uh, this, each individual state has their own policy as to whether or not they require residency. Um, so you really have to check the particular state. Some states, I know for a fact, do require residency. Many states do not require residency. So that's something, unfortunately, if she goes to our site or nasba.org and then looks at the various states she's considering sit or, sitting in, that'll dictate whether or not they need that residency requirement. And then if they do need the residency, um, and then certainly that's the state you're going to go to work in or what have you, then you could take the necessary steps to start establishing that residency. I don't think you, and even in the states that require residency, I don't think it's to sit for the exam. I think most of those states, it's to ultimately get the license in that state. So while you may not currently have residency, if you plan on moving and working to that state, you will certainly develop that residency. Great, great. Um, this is an, I think this is kind of an interesting question. I'm sure a lot of our, our students or candidates are, are thinking about this themselves. Um, should I attend all four sections of the exam this summer before I start working? You know, uh, I, again, I, I don't want to see somebody spread themselves too thin and wind up trying to do too much and then accomplishing nothing. I think it's very doable uh, to, to get all four parts out of the way over the summer. I think it's doable. Assuming you're not working part-time and you're not going to school and you're studying full-time, uh, whoever asks should check in, in their uh, uh, metro if we have what's called the fast pass. It's geared towards students who have just graduated and really want to try to knock out all four parts. It's, it's the regular course, but it's condensed because you are studying full-time for the exam. So then we have a study plan that makes it very doable to not only take the core, all four parts of the course, but also to put together a study plan that ideally would, would have you passing all four parts of the exam either just before you start working or at a minimum you may have to take one part 
after you start working at full time, but you would have already completed the course. So even though you just started working full time, you'd be in review mode. And then if you do the regulation or, or audit last, it's okay if you do that one last, because then when you get hired, you're actually getting inundated with that new hire training. So please research what's called fast pass, and you can either do that online or live in your particular city. Well, Peter, I think we're, um, we're out of time here. I know we've tried to get through as many of your questions as, as we can. We'll continue to, to answer questions um, you know, in, the, in the next few, uh, few minutes after the, the webinar concludes here. But uh, certainly we appreciate your insights, Peter. I'm going to turn it back over to Jeff um, Phillip from College Frog. Hey, thank you. So, so two quick housekeeping items. First of all, that would that uh, if Stacy doesn't mind, uh, we'll, we'll continue answering some of the questions that you typed in. Um, if you'll just keep your webinar open uh, for any students who ask questions, there's a, there's another ten or so that didn't get answered. Um, Stacy, thank you for doing such a great job of answering these questions uh, directly. And Peter, we thank you so much for a, for an awesome. Uh, presentation and great information. Um, it, it's an indication of, of how interesting or interesting everybody is in this topic. That we, we've had so many questions, most I've ever seen. And to the students on the uh, uh, on this webinar, thank you for for um, participating. I think this has been outstanding. A couple of couple of things to keep in mind. Um, uh, we will be sending a follow up message to you tomorrow, and that's going to have a couple of important pieces for you. One is uh, we're going to include Becker's links on social media, places like Facebook. If one of your questions didn't get answered, I know that the, the Becker team would, would appreciate if you posted that question on Facebook because uh, they're, they're great about answering questions. They want to hear from you. So please, uh, please do that. And Secondly, um, tomorrow there's one final webinar at the conclusion of Meet the Firms Week about uh, about using using social media to build your personal brand as an as an accounting job seeker. If you haven't registered for that, you can do so at at meetthefirmsweek.com. We'll be sending you a, a link to the replay of this recording, so if if you'd like to walk through it again, that'll be available. So be looking out for that in our follow-up email as well. So, with that, thank you to Becker. Uh, to your to your team and Peter for your outstanding expertise here today. We'll stay on if you'd like and um, and answer a few more of these questions over the webinar, not over the phone, but uh, but we'll type in the responses directly to you. Thank you so much for for attending today's session. We really appreciate everybody's involvement and have a wonderful day. Bye now. Thank you guys. Best of luck to everybody. Thank you for t tuning in. Bye bye.